Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's ACE TA Center webinar. <clears throat> I am Lisa Liu, and I'm the principal, principal investigator for ACE. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our presentation today, focused on open enrollment considerations for both the Medicare open enrollment and marketplace open enrollment period. <clears throat> We're going to chat out the link to download today's webinar slides. So before we get started, here are some technical details. First, attendees are all in listen-only mode but we do encourage you to ask lots of questions using the chat box. You can do that at any time throughout the presentation and submit a, a question via the chat. And we'll take as many of your questions as we can at the end of today's session. And if you don't get, if we don't get to your question today, or if you think of another question after the webinar, you can always email us questions at acetacenter at jsi.com. <clears throat> the easiest way to listen to our webinar is through your computer. Uh, if you can't hear very well, check to make sure your computer audio is turned on and the volume is turned up. And if you're still having issues, try closing out and rejoining uh, the Zoom webinar session. And just in case we are chatting out the call in number in case you need it. So you can copy that um, for safekeeping in case you have connection issues. So for those of you who may be new to our webinars, we'd like to take a moment to introduce ourselves. The ACTA Center is a HRSA-supported technical assistance center that helps build the capacity of the Ryan White community to navigate the changing healthcare landscape and help people with HIV access and use their health coverage to ultimately improve health outcomes. And specifically, our project supports Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients and subrecipients to engage, enroll, and retain clients in Medicare, Medicaid, and individual health insurance options. We also aim to build organizational health insurance literacy thereby improving clients' capacity to use the healthcare system <clears throat> and communicate with clients about how to stay enrolled and use health coverage. And we do all this by developing and disseminating best practices and supporting resources and provi by providing technical assistance and training through national and localized activities. And our audiences include the Ryan White HIV AIDS program staff, clients, program managers, and administrators, as well as people who help enroll Ryan White program clients, such as navigators and certified application counselors. <clears throat> and you can find all of our resources, including our archived webinars um, on targethiv.org forward slash ACE. All, everyone who is attending today's webinar will receive an email um, when the webinar is archived and posted on Target HIV so that you can um, revisit it and share as well with your colleagues. Okay, so here is a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to start off with an update related to Medicaid unwinding and then move into updates on both Marketplace and Medicare open enrollment, including enrollment and financial assistance considerations for Ryan White program clients. And we'll then wrap it up by sharing a handful of helpful resources and move into the Q&A period. So today I am joined by Molly Tasso, who is the project director for the ACTA Center. She specializes in health reform and its implications for people living with HIV. And previous to her work at JSI, Molly was the policy manager and director of a healthcare navigator program at a Chicago-based HIV AIDS nonprofit organization. Unfortunately, Christine can't be with us today because she um, is under the weather. So I will be um, standing in for her portion of the uh, session. And then we're also joined uh, by Amy Killalay, who's an independent consultant providing public health policy and financing expertise to governmental public health agencies, nonprofits, payers, and providers. Amy's focus areas include HIV and hepatitis programs, public and private insurance coverage, public health and healthcare financing strategies, and medication access and pricing. So with that, I'll hand it over to Molly. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. So before we dive into um, Marketplace and Medicare open enrollment, um, I just want to take a moment and first ground us in the context of Medicaid unwinding, which continues to impact and inform coverage transitions for individuals. So as you may be aware, um, we've been going through a process called Medicaid unwinding. If you're not familiar with that term or unsure how we got here, I will give a very quick overview. So during the COVID-19 uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, states were required to keep individuals who were on Medicaid continuously enrolled. Um, and so this has been happening since March of 2020. Um, and states were required to do this if they wanted to receive enhanced funding from the federal government. Um, so this was called the continuous coverage requirement. And this requirement ended 
in the end of March, um, or March 31st of 2023, um, about three years after it began. So then in April, um, on April 1 of 2023 last year, so last year, uh, states were able to, be, to begin the process of redetermining eligibility for every person receiving Medicaid or CHIP benefits, and Medicaid programs could begin terminating coverage for people who were no longer eligible for the program. And this process is what we are referring to when we um, talk about the Medicaid unwinding process. So states had the option to begin this process in April of last year, um, but implementation has been staggered and unique from state to state. So as of today, we can say that most states have completed this process um, and returned to their normal Medicaid renewal operations, but there are still some states that are working through this process. Um, we're gonna go ahead and chat out some resources too, that if you wanna take a look to learn a little bit more about the unwinding, um, you'll have those there for yourself. So, as states have unwound Medicaid, they were required to provide data to CMS on items such um, items related to redeterminations and disenrollments. So we are able to understand a little bit about what has happened through this process sort of on a large scale. So we know that as of uh, August 1st of this year, um, at least 24.8 million people have been disenrolled from Medicaid during the un unwinding process. Um, almost 70% of these disenrollments were because of procedural issues. So um, think paperwork issues or um, a person was request, information was requested from a person they didn't get back in touch with the Medicaid office, things like that. Um, but they weren't disenrolled necessarily because they were determinatively found to be ineligible for Medicaid. So these individuals um, are eligible to re-enroll into Medicaid at any time if they are eligible. Um, but of course, in this type of situation, there's real concern about losing folks in that follow-up process. Um, the other about 30% of people disenrolled from Medicaid were found to be ineligible. Um, and so if they haven't already, they should be screened for eligibility for a different coverage type, including marketplace, Medicare, or, Medicare or um, employer-sponsored insurance. Um, so I would say sort of top line takeaway from the slide is that over the past year and a half, there have been a lot of ex uh, people experiencing shifts in health coverage, um, specifically as it relates to Medicaid. Um, and we can't say for certain that all individuals, um, all in eligible individuals have been enrolled into new coverage type if they were disenrolled from Medicaid. So we really uh, encourage you all to keep this population of folks in mind as you prepare for marketplace and Medicare open enrollment periods. Um, so before we um, transition away fully from Medicaid, um, we're just gonna take a, a minute and then we have a couple polls for you all, or no, one poll, sorry. So um, we, we're just curious as we um, as we get into Marketplace, um, curious to, to sort of get a pulse check um, on the challenges that you all are experiencing when enrolling clients into health coverage. So you should see the poll there on your screen um, and please check all that apply. So um, do you have, are you challenged by addressing client concerns about health coverage, um, determining eligibility for health coverage, completing enrollment applications, knowing when to enroll. I'm not seeing. It looks like the poll got closed. I don't know, um, Mikey or Connor, if you're able to reopen it up. All right, it should relaunch now. There we go. I'm seeing some responses come in. All right. We give folks a few more moments to respond. And then if there's anything else, any other sort of unique um, or specific challenge that you want to share with us, please do let us know in the chat. Um, right, I think we can give folks a few more moments. I think we're still really in. Looks like, um, before we close, looks like determining client eligibility for health coverage and addressing client concerns are sort of rising to the top. Um, all right, Mikey, you can go ahead and close the poll if you want to, thank you. So yeah, it looks like addressing client concerns about health coverage, um, such as plan affordability and determining client eligibility for health coverage um, are really sort of up there in terms of challenges, as well as completing enrollment applications. Um, 
So this is super, this is very helpful for us to know. Um, and, and also, um, you know, as we move into um, our presentation day, we'll be able to share quite a few resources with you all that will help you um, help hopefully address some of these challenges and concerns that you all are experiencing in, in the field. All right, so let's get into our updates for the upcoming Marketplace open enrollment period. So as a very quick reminder, the Marketplace is a virtual shopping and enrollment platform or an exchange, some people will call it. Um, and this is for medical insurance. Um, and this the Marketplace was created through the Affordable Care Act or the ACA. We often say to think of it like an Expedia or like a hotel.com type of situation for health insurance where you can go in um, sort of set parameters um, and then view your options. So there are three forms of, of these types of marketplaces. Um, and again, these are just essentially portals or websites and there are three forms that they can take. So um, the first is a federally facilitated marketplace which is um, healthcare.gov. This is solely run by the federal government and all of the states that you're seeing on the slide here in light blue, they use healthcare.gov. Uh, the second type of exchange is called the state-based marketplace. Um, this is where the state creates its own marketplace, um, and it's incentivized to do this by having um, being able to have a bit more flexibility on how to set it up. Um, on the, the map there, these, um, these states are indicated by like the darker middle blue color. And then the third type is a joint state-based federally facilitated marketplaces, which is a sort of a hybrid model. Um, so states in this situation would take on more of the plan management function so that they can have more control and oversight of the market, but they still use healthcare.gov as the exchange website. Um, states that have that sort of joint setup are in the very dark blue color. Um, and so just to note too, um, that these categories can change. Once a state, you know, a state is not sort of locked into their exchange type um, once, they, once they choose that. So for instance, Virginia transitioned to a state-based exchange this year and Georgia will be making um, a transition next year. So this map um, does update every year. So the marketplace, what, what is it? What is sold there? So the insurance products that are sold on the marketplace are fairly regulated with lots of consumer protections um, with the goal that coverage is comprehensive and that people with pre-existing conditions aren't discriminated against. So for example, marketplace plans have to cover 10 essential health benefits and that's required by law. The marketplace also offers financial assistance to eligible individuals. These are offered in the forms of premium tax credits and or cost sharing reductions. So a premium tax credit is, as it's, uh, as it's named, a tax credit that's used to lower the monthly premium payment. Um, and these are available to individuals with household income starting at 100% of the federal poverty level for most people. And then folks can also um, take these um, up front. So these can be also provided in the form of an advanced premium tax credit. So you're getting that, um, you're not having to wait until you file taxes to get to, to see that um, to see that money come through. You can get it on a monthly basis, which knocks down your, your premium payment um, every month. And then um, the other form of, of financial assistance is a cost sharing reduction. So this is a discount that lowers the amount that individuals have to pay for out-of-pocket costs, such as deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance. And these are automatically calculated and applied during the application process. So there's no sort of um, back of the envelope map that a person has to do when they're when they're taking a look at the, the price comparisons of plans, those are automatically applied. And we're gonna chat out a, um, the ACA Center has a, a fact sheet on PTCs and CSRs that we will share out now. Um, so you can learn a little bit more about that. So to be eligible for the marketplace, enroll into coverage for the marketplace, an individual must um, live in the United States. They must be a US citizen or, um, or national or be lawfully present and they cannot be incarcerated. So uh, believe it or not, open enrollment is just around uh, the corner. It begins on November 1st of this year and it runs through January 15th of next year. Um, for a person to have coverage that starts January 1st, which is the earliest that new coverage can begin, folks need to enroll by December 15th of this year. If folks enroll after December 15th up through January 15th, then coverage will begin on February 1st. Um, and just a note that one of the flexibilities that state-based state exchanges have is to elongate um, their open enrollment period so that if you're in one of those states that we've noted on the, on the map slide at the beginning, 
you'll just want to check with your state marketplace website to see if the open enrollment dates in your state are different. All right, so we are going to go ahead and review some important reminders and considerations for open enrollment this year, um, some of which are new. <clears throat> so first is the, um, the very exciting uh, news that deferred action for childhood arrival recipients, so DACA recipients, they're now eligible to enroll into a qualified health plan through the marketplace, <clears throat> and they're eligible to receive financial assistance through um, premium tax credits and CSRs. So this exciting new update was made possible by a rule finalized by the current administration, and it allows for DACA recipients to qualify for a special enrollment period to select a plan through the marketplace during uh, the 60 days following the rules November 1st, 2024 effective date. So obviously this um, timing corresponds with the 2025 open enrollment period. So the thinking there is that newly eligible individuals will be able to seamlessly enroll in coverage, um, but because they're enrolling through an SCP, they won't have to wait until January 1 um, to have their marketplace coverage begin. Um, the second exciting update is that the final ACA section 1557 rule, um, which prohibits health insurers from discrimination on the basis of, of race, sex, national origin, age, disability, um, this rule was finalized and it goes into effect on January 1 of next year. And the rule applies both to states that use healthcare.gov and also to state-based marketplaces. Um, okay, there are also a couple important SEPs to keep in mind. So as a reminder, um, SEPs are basically an exception to the requirement that folks um, enroll in a marketplace coverage only during open enrollment, and it allows folks to enroll outside of that period if they meet a specified SEP circumstance. So the low, in the low income SEP allows folks with um, incomes up to 150% of the FPL to enroll at the federal poverty level, to enroll in health insurance at any time of the year. Um, so this SEP essentially opens up enrollment on a monthly basis for people with, with income at this threshold. So again, 150% and below, and for folks that qualify for APTCs. So not only can people enroll in new coverage, but then they can also make changes to their coverage during the year as their circumstances may change. Um, there's also the unwinding SEP. For individuals who lose, and this is in reference to the Medicaid unwinding process that I talked about earlier. So this is for individuals who lose Medicaid or CHIP coverage between March 31st of last year, 2023, and November 30th of this year. So this SEP was in place last year, um, but it was extended to overlap with the, the November 1st open enrollment start date. Um, and again, similar thinking that um, this having this SEP in place would eliminate a gap in coverage for people who may have lost their Medicaid coverage and who might be seeking for marketplace coverage to begin before January 1st of next year, which is, again, the earliest date um, that new coverage can begin outside of an SCP. So a person can apply uh, for 60 days before losing their coverage and can access the SCP by submitting or updating an application on healthcare.gov and answering yes to the question about whether their Medicaid or CHIP recently ended or will soon end. Um, and then people have 60 days after they did um, after they've been determined eligible for the marketplace to then select a plan and pay their first month's premium. All right. And then I'm also happy to share um, another reminder that uh, the gap on the, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. I'm happy to share that um, the, the, the gap um, has been eliminated between the loss of coverage and new plan effective date. So starting this past January, Marketplaces are allowed to make coverage effective on the first day of the month in which the triggering event occurred. So this is to say if someone um, attests that they will lose coverage on, let's say, Medicaid or they will lose Medicaid coverage on August 15th, if they pick a plan by July 31st, so the month before, that QHP effective date can be August 1st. So again, this is just an effort to minimize gaps in coverage, reduce churn, um, make sure people have that sort of that continuity of care and coverage. Um, a few more things to note, all good things. So first, the enhanced subsidies are still in place, which means it is still a very good deal for people to get marketplace coverage. 
Um, the enhanced premium subsidies are now in place through 2025, um, and these have resulted in millions of people being eligible for, for very low cost, um, even zero dollar plans. So anyone under 150% uh, of the federal poverty line will qualify for a plan with zero dollar premiums. Um, also happy to remind you that the subsidy cliff has been eliminated through 2025, so through next year. So this means that individuals with incomes over 400% of the FPL will not have to pay more than 8.5% of their monthly um, income on a silver plan premium. And then finally, just a reminder that individuals um, cannot be denied APTCs unless they have failed to reconcile APTCs So um, for two consecutive years. So when I talked about the, those, those financial resources available earlier, um, if a person receives APTC, so again, that's that's getting that financial help ahead of time on a monthly basis instead of waiting to get a tax credit when they file taxes. The, the, the key there is that you have to, at the end of the year, when you go to file taxes, you just have to reconcile that. So just noting in your tax forms that you received this financial help, make sure that you don't, um, uh, making sure you don't owe anything, um, making sure that that's reconciled, and then that allows you to remain eligible for that financial assistance in the, the consecutive years. And then finally, I just want to end this section by reminding you that you are not alone in this work. So CMS announced record high funding for navigators over the next five years. And as a reminder, navigators are experts. They are trained to help consumers enroll into marketplace coverage. They are unbiased sources of information. They are free um, and they are in um, every state. So we strongly encourage you all to um, use the link that we're going to chat out here to um, type in your zip code and find a navigator near you. And do not hesitate to reach out and leverage that source um, of, of support through, through open enrollment and throughout the year. So before handing it over to Lisa and Amy to get into Medicare, I just want to offer a few sort of tips um, suggestions, best practices, things that you and your programs can be doing now to get ready for open enrollment. So um, first is, is um, sort of check the box by being here. So conducting training and building staff enrollment capacity. So really during this time leading up to open enrollment, um, work on building um, health, the health insurance literacy of staff, um, focus on um, specific plan considerations for, for people with HIV, um, so, for example, some state ADAP programs will review all the plans offered on the marketplace and may make plan recommendations for Ryan White clients, um, for ADAPs that provide financial assistance for insurance purchasing. They might require that a client enroll into, partic into a particular plan. Um, and so it's very important to uh, check in with your ADAP programs to see what, if any, plan recommendations or requirements they may have. Um, we also suggest that you consider getting staff trained as certified application counselors. It's a very similar type of training as navigators um, and requires that an organization register as a certified designation organization. Um, we can chat out more information at the end of today's webinar, but that's another great opportunity to, um, to leverage the trainings that are available and to build staff capacity um, to, conduct, to conduct enrollments. Um, we do also, though, Acknowledge that having all enrollment capacity um, in-house simply might not just be an option for your program. And so we do encourage programs in this situation to build enrollment partnerships. So this includes identifying and establishing partnerships with health insurance agents, brokers, navigators, CACs, other enrollment assistants in your community. Um, and then when you, when you are doing that, when you're leveraging that outside enrollment assistance, making sure that those partners are aware of, of the Ryan White program of the ADAP program, making sure that they understand um, the unique sort of healthcare needs and I would say like prescription medication needs of people living with HIV and um, just make sure that they understand um, that those considerations must be taken into account when helping someone um, find a health plan. Um, we also encourage, um, on the next slide please, we also encourage Ryan White case managers and other staff to conduct what we call account tune-ups. So in the weeks and months leading up to open enrollment, um, these are just really a, a, a sort of a process of, of getting folks ready and prepared um, to start doing enrollments, to start being enrolled come November 1st. So steps include making sure that a client has access to or has gathered um, any financial documents or paperwork they'll need to project income on their marketplace application, 
and also making sure that they can log into their marketplace account and that their password is all set. I know we've all, you know, forgotten our passwords and you have to go through that whole process. So getting that done ahead of time if needed um, just makes sort of enrollment much smoother um, come this fall. Um, also reviewing finances, especially for those who have received APTC, APTCs in the past. Um, like I mentioned earlier, making sure that they have filed federal taxes and reconciled those past APTCs. Again, all with the goal of not losing eligibility um, for this source of financial assistance in the coming years. And then we also encourage folks to just confirm a client's ADAP enrollment. And if their research date is coming up soon, for example, during open enrollment, just go ahead and recertify ADAP enrollment now so a person doesn't run into any issues um, receiving financial assistance from ADAP if that applies within your, your state or your jurisdiction. And then finally, account tune-ups um, include assessing health plans and conducting client outreach. So um, I mentioned it earlier, but this involves checking in with your state's ADAP and learning if they are making plan recommendations and to learn about what financial assistance options are available to clients. Um, and if not, maybe even doing some plan research yourself so that you understand what, um, what the options are in your, your marketplace this year. Um, and then finally, scheduling enrollment appointments with clients, setting aside some designated time to discuss, to discuss health insurance um, and to make sure that you set aside time to sit down, look through the options and complete enrollment. So we hope with some of this prep work, um, it helps set up programs for a very smooth and efficient open enrollment period. Um, and then finally, just because Medicaid unwinding is happening and that there is a group of people who have been disenrolled from Medicaid and, and, and maybe enrolling into Marketplace, just a few tips specific to this particular type of health coverage transition. So just a reminder that for clients who have been disenrolled from Medicaid and moving into Marketplace, um, this, um, well, first of all, minimizing gaps is should, should be um, paramount in terms of like, in terms of um, your approach to getting them into coverage. So Certainly really um, hoping that folks take advantage again of the unwinding SCP or another marketplace SCP if they might qualify for that. Um, and because this allows them not to wait until November 1st to enroll. Um, and again, that allows them to um, hopefully have health coverage that starts before the January 1st um, date. And then um, as I was saying, when talking with clients that have been disenrolled um, from Medicaid, moving into marketplace, just a reminder that marketplace coverage can look very different compared to Medicaid. Um, for example, a person may be paying a premium for the first time. They may need to think about um, budgeting for out-of-pocket costs, such as co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance. They might be taken aback or confused by receiving, you know, for when receiving a bill in the mail, for example. So having those conversations with clients and just preparing them um, to both navigate those changes well, but also then be, be using their marketplace health insurance um, to its fullest extent. And then um, again, as always, if you receive an APTC, um, making sure that you um, talk to your client about making sure they file their taxes to reconcile that amount that they received. So I know that that was a lot of information. Um, we are going to pause for a couple polls before moving into Medicare, but I want to strongly encourage um, folks to be chatting in questions and taking a quick look. It looks like we are getting lots of questions. So keep that up. Um, we're going to go ahead and launch the second poll. So thinking about um, what types of marketplace technical assistance or training resources would be most helpful to you all. And we're curious to learn sort of how we can be um, most helpful and, and of service to you all. So um, can we launch the poll? Not seeing We're having anything. some technical difficulties oh. with the polls. So actually, oh. if folks just want to um, chat in right now, if that works, you can um, chat in uh, which of these would be the most. Most helpful useful. for you all. Or, yeah. yes, and if there's something else, please also let us know in the chat. Um, I'm seeing this come in. E-learning, e-learning modules seem to be making the cake here. All right. Wonderful. Yes, a lot of e-learning modules. Okay. This is very helpful. Thank you. Um, and then on the next slide, um, another question. So, and then in terms of um marketplace resources that would be most helpful to give to your clients. Um, 
what do you think that your clients would be most interested in receiving? Printable PDFs, palm cards, an online fact sheet, online FAQ, something else. And I'm I'm seeing a, I'm seeing quite a few printable PDFs coming through. So I'm I'm want to make that distinction that that's different than than an online you know FAQ or, or PDF. Okay, this is. Very helpful. Brochures, fact sheets, QR code links. Okay, nothing online with several explanation points. That's helpful. Thank you. All right, this is all. Keep chatting in, and if there are other, if there are types or you know, types of resources that we don't have listed here, please do chat them in. It's very very helpful for us to see, um, to know, you know, sort of what what you all are using in the field and and really what is most helpful for you all when you're working with your clients. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Amy to kick us off with Medicare open enrollment updates for uh, 2025. Terrific, thank you so much, Molly, and hi, everyone. Um, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and move to Medicare. Uh, so in addition to marketplace open enrollment, which is on the horizon, we're also heading into Medicare open enrollment season. Um, and this is a time when many Ryan White clients might be considering potential changes to their Medicare coverage. So um, let's kind of start with a, a quick overview of the, the kind of the what of, of Medicare. So it's a federal program and, and it is for folks who are over 65 and or disabled. And we'll talk about the eligibility specifics in a minute. But in terms of the what of Medicare, it, it basically breaks down um, into these parts that you see in front of you. And each part is covering sort of a different slice of coverage. So part A is going to be the part of Medicare that covers your hospital care. So that could be inpatient hospital care, hospice care, skilled nursing home. Part B, you sort of move outside of the hospital. And this is the part that covers all of your different doctor and other provider visits. visits. Um, it covers preventative services like vaccines. Um, and then particularly important for HIV, part B is the part that covers uh, provider administered drugs, and that's going to include the newer HIV long acting injectable antiretrovirals. And then finally, Part D. Um, and Part D is the part uh, of the Medicare benefits that cover prescription drugs. So that's our, our sort of alphabet soup of Medicare. And next slide. So um, there are, are sort of two major ways that consumers can access specifically the Medicare Part A and B benefits. So think of Part D as kind of like operating by itself. And that makes sense. Part D was actually an add-on to Medicare. It was not included in the original Medicare program. So Part D and the way Part D is operating with Medicare Part D plans, that's, that's happening. You all know how that works. That's sort of separate. But Part A and B benefits, so the hospital and then the provider covered services that we just talked about, there are two ways that, that consumers, that your clients can access those benefits. The first is the first one you see on the left hand of the chart here, and that's what's called original or some people call it traditional Medicare. So that's really think about that as where the federal government is in charge. They're administering the coverage, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. There, the provider network is going to be completely open, right? You go to any provider, most providers in this country, they have to accept Medicare, and they do, and that's a, a very open provider network. So that's a plus. It's often a draw for traditional Medicare, but the cost sharing for traditional Medicare is sometimes higher than it'll be in Medicare Advantage. So it's generally 20% of the cost of the service across the board. Many people who enroll in traditional Medicare because of that high 20% coinsurance, also end up enrolling in what's called a Medigap plan. Um, and that's basically a, a private supplemental insurance plan that sort of layers on top of your Medicare A and B, and is just used to cover cost sharing. So it doesn't cover any services or anything like that. It's an insurance plan for your cost sharing, right? And so many, many people, including many uh, Ryan White clients, enroll in a Medigap so that they can help um, uh, that can help defray some of the high cost sharing they might have in traditional Medicare. Um, so if you think that your client might you know, be better served in traditional Medicare, but might have uh, challenges paying their Medicare Part A and B cost sharing, Medigap is, is something to think about. And you got to enroll in that right when a client is first eligible for Medicare, because it's actually pretty hard to get to add Medigap after the fact. 
Um, and then, you know, as I said, think about Medicare Part D, it's just kind of hanging out there separately. You would, people who enroll in traditional Medicare would also enroll in a Medicare Part D prescription drug plan. So think about that as like choose your own adventure A. And then, because I said there's two options uh, to, to get the Part A and Part B services for Medicare, the other option is for clients to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, which is also called Medicare Part C. Um, and this is basically, it's a different delivery mechanism for those same Part A and B services that are covered in traditional Medicare. So instead of the federal government administering the benefit like we just talked about in traditional Medicare, private insurance plans are providing the coverage. So the federal government is contracting with these private insurance plans to, to provide, to deliver the Medicare Part A and B services. So sort of bundle it together and kind of put it in a private insurance plan and then offer it to Medicare beneficiaries. So benefits of Medicare Advantage plans are that the cost sharing might be a little lower than we see the 20% coinsurance in Medicare, in traditional Medicare A and B. So that's a, a plus. Um, those Medicare Advantage plans, they might cover additional services that you don't see covered in traditional Medicare. So some of these MA plans are covering hearing, dental, and vision services. Those are not required Medicare benefits, but the plans are doing it to kind of get people in as an extra benefit, an extra bonus. And then the downside, you know, it's sort of the flip side of the upside of traditional Medicare. Provider, the provider networks that Medicare Advantage plans have are often narrower, way narrower than you would see with the kind of the open network of traditional Medicare. So it's it's a um, it's a comparison that every client sort of has to do, and you can do that comparison. You've got the link there at Medicare.gov. You can look, you can pair, compare original Medicare versus Medicare Advantage plans and make a decision. And the last thing I'll say is that I wish, and somebody always asks, like, okay, but what's the rule of thumb for Ryan White clients? And I wish there, that I could say, you know, there's just a there's a good rule of thumb of always do Medicare Advantage or always do traditional Medicare. Um, and there's really, unfortunately, not. It's a very individualized decision. Sometimes it depends on what other help a client is eligible for or getting, and that includes Ryan White and ADOP assistance. So in many cases, ADOP and Ryan White are covering the premiums and cost sharing for Medicare beneficiaries, but that varies depending on what jurisdiction you are in and what their eligibility criteria are and what slices of uh, uh, cost sharing and premium assistance the, the program is covering. So it does have to be sort of individualized, but those are some of the factors that um, you know folks working with clients enrolling in Medicare can take into consideration. So next slide. So um, as I said, you know, sort of generally Medicare is available for folks over 65 and folks with a qualifying disability. It's also available for folks with end-stage renal disease and ALS. So those are very specific um, sort of carved out eligibility groups for Medicare. Um, there are uh, uh, citizenship and immigration requirements. So clients um, or beneficiaries have to be a US citizen or a legal resident for at least five years to qualify for Medicare. Um, and to note there too, and this always comes up when we talk about disability, HIV by itself is not a um, uh, uh, an automatic disability diagnosis. People with HIV can meet the Social Security Administration uh, definition of disability, but it's a fairly extensive test. So HIV factors in, but by itself, it is not a um, singularly qualifying condition for a disability. All right, so next slide. So now enrollment periods, and that's kind of what we're gearing up for with this webinar and, and what we're approaching in, in October. Um, so for most beneficiaries, Medicare, like the marketplace, only allows enrollment or plan switches at certain times of a year. So we're talking about the sort of plan switch time, and there have been many other uh, webinars, and there's resources that we can chat out around the um, uh, Medicare initial enrollment periods and, and considerations for the year initial enrollment into Medicare. But in, in addition to that, you know, initial enrollment based on your age, there are also um, uh, the availability of, of switching plans or switching from traditional Medicare to Medicare Advantage um, uh, at certain times of year. So open enrollment starts in just a few weeks for Medicare. It starts on October 15th and runs through December 7th. Um, and that's the time where folks can make changes. If they're in original or traditional Medicare and they want to hop out of that and into a Medicare Advantage plan, they can do that or vice versa. Um, folks with a Medicare Advantage plan, if you lock into a Medicare Advantage plan, 
and you realize you actually want to go into a different Medicare Advantage plan, you have until January 1st to March 31st. It's a different Medicare Advantage open enrollment period where you can switch Medicare Advantage funds. You can't jump out of your Medicare Advantage and into traditional Medicare during that time, but you can move into a different plan um, if, if somebody feel like they, they need to. And there are, as always, because it's the U.S. healthcare system and we have lots of exceptions and things, um, there are some exceptions to when this open enrollment period applies. And for instance, lower income folks who are receiving Medicaid assistance to help with their Medicare or they're enrolled in extra help, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, they, uh, they can change plans multiple times a year. They have a, a different ability than most other Medicare beneficiaries to make changes. Um, and then in addition to that, there are also, just as where we saw with the marketplace, there are special enrollment periods, right? So they're pretty limited, but it sort of takes this idea of if something happens where you missed an open enrollment period, you are allowed to make a change or enroll without a penalty. Um, and so that's that's another um, you know exception for the, the open enrollment period. So next slide. So now that, um, and we sort of covered this already. Um, so now that, that uh, we covered our special enrollment period um, and then the note on the date-based um, enrollment periods, um, uh, uh, October 15th to December 7th and January 1st, March 31st. I think I covered this content on the previous slide, but you have it all there. So let's jump to the next slide. All right. So now that we have like the Medicare basics are like quick, um, very quick uh, review of the Medicaid part eligibility and sort of the, the basics of how open enrollment dates work, um, we do want to flag a couple of things that are either new for 2025 or what we'll term like newish. They've gone into effect in the past year or two, but um, they're still on the newish side and we think you guys um, should be aware. So um, the, the first thing uh, that, that is new actually starting this year is that um, later this year, and it's anticipated um, at, at any moment, um, <laughs> that uh, uh, PrEP, so pre-exposure prophylaxis, the um, HIV antiretroviral medications that are prescribed for the prevention of HIV, PrEP will be covered by Medicare. Um, and there are a few things to note. It will be covered by Medicare, but all PrEP medications, including oral medications that have traditionally been covered under Medicare Part D, will be covered under Medicare Part B, um, and it will they, they will be covered without cost sharing. So if any of you are, are sort of steeped in the private insurance space, you know that because of the ACA preventative services requirements, PrEP has to be covered by most private insurance plans without any cost sharing to the consumer. So what Medicare is doing is basically aligning with that. And they're saying, okay, us too. We will also cover PrEP without cost sharing for the medications and then for at least a subset of the ancillary services for PrEP without cost sharing. The trick about Medicare, because Medicare works in all of these parts systems, is that they are going to move all of the oral medications for PrEP to the Part B benefit, right? From Part D to Part B. And the, the reason for that is because that's how they're going to cover it without cost sharing. So if you're sitting out there thinking, but I don't work on prevention, we're here for a Ryan White webinar, you're right, um, that is true. Um, this is, does not apply to Ryan White clients. This applies to people who are using HIV antiretrovirals for PrEP, not treatment. We're flagging this for Ryan White recipients because it's possible that the rollout in this change from the Part D benefit to the Part B benefit uh, will raise some questions. And for providers, pharmacy, and clients alike, particularly clients who are on HIV treatment and just want to be assured that nothing changes for them. So I'm assuring you, nothing changes for folks who are on HIV treatment whose ARVs are covered under the Part D benefit. Treatment stays exactly the same, covered the same as it always been, will still have cost sharing associated with it. It's just the prep that's changing. And we also know many of you uh, out there are working both with folks who are living with HIV and folks um, who are uh, accessing PrEP. And so it's important just to know about this because this is a big deal. This means that somebody on Medicare who needs to get PrEP, whereas before they would be paying whatever that specialty cost share for PrEP is, um, now they will be paying zero for the medication 
uh, including long acting products um, and for, again, a subset of those ancillary services. So stay tuned. That's um, going to go into effect later this year. And um, I'm sure the, the ACA Center will send out a notice when that becomes official. All right, so next slide. So moving along in terms of other changes in 2025, um, I'm just flagging this sort of rapid fire, and this is mostly to, to um, pique your interest because there will be another uh, webinar just on these changes because they are quite significant, um, but just to flag them so you have them in your head and you come back uh, to this space for more information. Um, lots of changes to the Medicare Part D. So remember Part D, prescription drug benefit, lots of changes to the plan designs of Part D plans and changes in good ways. So the, the, the long story short here is that for consumers, Part D coverage is going to be cheaper, right? The cost sharing for Part D, not the premiums necessarily, but the cost sharing for Part D going to be cheaper starting in 2025. We eliminate the coverage gap phase altogether. That has been um, you know uh, slowly sort of phased out starting with the Affordable Care Act and over the last decade. Um, and completely gone starting in 2025. So a much simpler uh, sort of coverage phases um, uh, for, for folks. You're gonna have your deductible, then you're gonna have your regular coverage phase, and then you're gonna have an out-of-pocket maximum. So that's a big deal. Part B has never had a, an out-of-pocket maximum. Um, that has been a, a real uh, a gap. And so starting in 2025, there will be an annual out-of-pocket maximum for Part D cost sharing of $2,000. So once a client pays $2,000 out of pocket, including any payments made for that client um, by a Ryan White or ADAP, uh, no more cost sharing for prescription drugs for the rest of the year. Um, and then finally, starting in 2025, folks will have, Medicare beneficiaries will have the option to smooth their out of pocket costs over the plan year in smaller monthly payments rather than larger payments that would be part of a deductible or co-insurance early in the year. Um, and that's through what's called the Medicare Prescription Payment Plan. Um, we'll cover details about all of this in the upcoming webinar, including the Medicare Prescription Payment Plan. It's not um, quite a, a big deal for Ryan White and ADAP clients who are getting Ryan White or ADAP assistance with Medicare Part D. Um, it really won't make much sense for those clients to be enrolling in that smoothing, that Medicare Prescription Payment Plan program. But again, more details coming soon. Next slide. More details coming soon, and I can tell you exactly when that soon will be, October 29th. Um, so uh, lock this in, and you'll be seeing um, other communication from the, the ACE folks on this. But we will talk all about this on October 29th, a deep dive on uh, the $2,000 cap, the changes to the um, donut hole, um, and the Medicare prescription payment plan. So um, register now. Um, join us then. It will be fun. Next slide. So um, now I want to kind of move to just some reminders. Um, these are our reforms that um, are not necessarily new. They are new-ish. They're still important to keep in mind. Um, and this first one is this special enrollment period. And this very much aligns with what Molly was talking about in terms of the, um, the transitions from Medicaid to another form of coverage. So Molly was talking about Medicaid to marketplace. And now I'm going to talk about Medicaid to Medicare. Um, so there, there is an SEP that's been in place as a result of the Medicaid unwinding that Molly talked about, um, and the SEP lasts for six months from either the date the individual is no longer eligible for Medicaid um, or notified that they are no longer eligible um, for Medicaid, whichever is later. So that's an important protection. You just get an extra, extra time to make that transition from Medicare to Medicare, um, with, from Medicaid to Medicare without penalty. Um, and if an individual enrolled into Medicare during the public health emergency prior to January 2023 and paid late enrollment fees, they can have those fees reimbursed. I'm not sure how many people are totally aware of that and sort of have gone back to claw those back, but that is still very much a right that beneficiaries have. Next slide. Um, and then finally, just a, a few more reforms um, that are already in effect, but are super important for Ryan White clients. Um, the first is one that that I know that the ACA Center has been talking about since it went to, into effect last January, but um, that's the expansion of extra help. So that program um, is is super important for lower income uh, people with HIV and Ryan White clients. Um, it uh, allows folks to enroll in Medicare Part D plans with no premiums and with 
um, very low limited deductibles and co-payments for their Part D coverage. Um, so that was expanded. It used to be that there were two tiers of extra help. There was a low income subsidy and then there was a partial low income subsidy. So now it's like there's just one tier and it's the better of the two tiers. So um, anyone who has income below 150% FPL is eligible for extra help um, starting last January. So this will still be in effect in 2025. Um, and then finally, um, the the other um, reforms have been in effect for a couple of years now, but um, really impact clients with comorbidities or additional health needs. Um, insulin is now available without a deductible for $35 a month. There's lots of people on Medicare with HIV and diabetes, and this has been a really important protection and cost share um, affordability provision for them. And then vaccines that are recommended by ASIP, um, the, the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, have to be provided without cost sharing. So just some um, additional things that ease the, the cost sharing and affordability burdens um, for uh, conditions related to HIV. So um, that brings you up to speed on some of the, the new and newer things happening in the Medicare space. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Thanks so much, Amy, for walking us through all of those really important updates and reminders about Medicare open enrollment for this fall. <clears throat> um, so let's talk about what you need to do if your client is transitioning from Medicaid to Medicare for the first time. There are two different ways to navigate this coverage transition, depending on the timing and when your client first becomes Medicare eligible. So the first scenario here is uh, when your client already became eligible for Medicare during the public health emergency, but did not enroll in Medicare because they still had Medicaid coverage. So now that the Medicaid continuous coverage unwinding is coming to an end, as Molly talked about, if your client is deemed ineligible for Medicaid, they can enroll in Medicare using the six month special enrollment period for loss of Medicaid coverage that Amy described a few slides ago. And if it has been more than six months since the client's Medicaid coverage was terminated, uh, they can enroll during the Medicare general enrollment period, which is from January 1st to March 31st of 2025. Late enrollment penalties are waived if enrolling through the SEP, and depending on how long the client delayed enrollment, they may not be assessed a penalty if they enroll during the GEP either. The second scenario, um, here for you all is when your client will soon become, become eligible for Medicare and will soon be or, or may have already been terminated from Medicaid coverage. So it's always a best practice to help clients enroll in Medicaid during their seventh month, seven month initial enrollment period, which is centered around the month of their 65th birthday. So if you can help them enroll during the first three months of their IEP or initial enrollment period, their Medicare coverage will begin when they turn 65. This helps, by doing this, it helps to avoid gaps in coverage. And it's also important to remember that the Ryan White program and ADAP program can also support clients during these types of health coverage transitions. So you may also be working with clients who are becoming dually eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare for the first time. This includes people who remained eligible for Medicaid during the public health emergency and are also newly eligible for Medicare too. So we have a few considerations here for you all to keep in mind. Dually eligible clients can receive benefits from both programs and they should enroll in any of the Medicare parts that they're eligible for as soon as they become eligible in order to avoid any late enrollment penalties. You can encourage clients to keep an eye on their mail for any Medicaid renewal notices and help them complete those applications or requests for information promptly to avoid losing their Medicaid coverage. And in some states, Medicaid renewal applications for folks who are turning 65 will have slightly different eligibility criteria. So they will likely be rescreened for a different Medicare eligibility category, a Medicare savings program and the extra help, extra help program, um, all of which can help with Medicare costs. And I just want to note that it is possible to lose Medicaid eligibility, but still remain eligible or become newly eligible for a Medicare savings program, um, which means the state Medicaid program helps the client pay for some or all of their Medi Medicare costs. So we'll chat out some information. Um, I see Connor has already chatted out information about the Medicare savings programs. 
So on the other hand, it's possible that a client who was previously dually eligible for Medicaid and Medicare will lose their Medicaid coverage this year and only remain eligible for Medicare. So for someone who has been dually eligible, they may have um, they may be used to having most or all of their Medicare costs paid for. Losing Medicaid coverage means they are losing dual eligibility and their out-of-pocket costs um, for Medicare costs will increase because the Medicaid program is no longer helping out with those costs. So if you have a client in this situation, we encourage you to consider helping them enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan or if they have Medicare or if they have original Medicare to enroll in a Medigap policy to help offset some of the costs. They will qualify for a three month long special enrollment period beginning either on the date that they receive the Medicaid termination notice or the date that their Medicaid coverage ends, whichever is later. And their new coverage would then begin in the month after that they enroll. Your client can also uh, enroll during the upcoming Medicare enrollment period, which begins on October 15th, and coverage would begin on January 1st, 2025. In any of these scenarios, there are four best practices that we encourage you to keep in mind when supporting your clients to enroll in Medicare. So that's ensuring continuity of coverage, actively um, enrolling in coverage, enrolling when a client first becomes eligible and providing one-on-one -on -one enrollment support. So I'll, um, let's dive into each of these in one more detail. So the first best practice is to ensure continuity of coverage for your client's existing providers and current medications whenever possible. possible. It's important for case managers to confirm with clients that their current providers accept Medicare. And you can do this by either visiting medicare.gov and using the care compare tool or you can help your clients call their providers, letting them know that the client's insurance will be changing to Medicare and confirming whether the provider accepts original Medicare and or Medicare Advantage. If the provider states that their preferred plan is a Medicare Advantage plan, you'll want to make sure to ask uh, whether they are referring to an HMO plan or a PPO plan. And case managers should also help their cl clients compare Medicare drug plans in their area and choose one that covers their HIV medications as well as their other non-HIV medications. So you can do this by visiting medicare.gov and using the plan compare tool as well. The Ryan White program, including ADAP, may be able to help pay for Medicare premiums, deductibles, and copayments. The second best practice is to help clients actively enroll in Medicare. So for clients who choose original Medicare, which includes Medicare Part A hospital insurance and Medicare Part D medical insurance, they should enroll through the Social Security Administration. For clients who choose a Medicare Advantage plan or want to add on Medicare Part D prescription drug coverage or a Medigap supplemental insurance to original Medicare, they should enroll through medicare.gov so we've listed, listed those out to differentiate them on the slide. Most people who are eligible for Medicare must actively enroll in coverage, but there is a small set subset of people who are automatically enrolled. So this small subset of people includes people who are already receiving Social Security retirement benefits, people who are under um, the age of 65 with a qualifying disability who have received 24 or more months of Social Security disability benefits, and people with end-stage renal disease or ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. The third best practice is to enroll when first when, when folks are um, first eligible for coverage. So it's really important to do this, usually during the client's initial enroll enrollment period when they turn 65, in order to help them avoid late enrollment penalty penalties and minimize any gaps in coverage. So one way to do this is you can create automated reminders in your client's um, uh, electronic health record or your, um, your case management records, or ask a medical case manager to flag clients who are either approaching their 65th birthday or clients who will soon be receiving their 25th month of social security benefits. So this reminder is also an opportunity to start the discussion with clients ahead of time about their healthcare needs and their preferences and whether original Medicare or Medicare Advantage makes more sense for them and to start in scheduling enrollment appointments to start that process. And then finally, our fourth best practice is to provide one-on-one -on -one enrollment support. 
So Ryan White programs can do this by establishing a relationship with their local state health insurance assistance program or SHIP, which provides local and uh, objective one-on-one -on -one counseling and assistance to Medicare eligibility, Medicare eligible individuals, um, their families and care caregivers. So SHIP, SHIP counselors can be really, really helpful. They can help clients with reviewing their health and drug plan options, exploring financial assistance options, explain how Medicare works with other types of coverage and to help with more complex issues such as dual eligibility for both Medicare and Medicaid. Your organization um, may choose to refer clients to your local SHIP counselor or your SHIP organization for external Medicare enrollment support, or you can also consider supporting staff within your Ryan White program at your agency to become tra a trained SHIP counselor in order to build internal enrollment capacity. Ryan White Program and ADAPS uh, staff are ideal SHIP counselors because they understand the eligibility requirements for both Medicare and the Ryan White Program, as well as the unique coverage needs of people with HIV and the, then the state-specific programs to support Ryan White programs. So those folks who choose to become SHIP counselors um, have, to, have to go through special training and certification requirements, and these may vary by state but they do receive additional training on how to help folks enroll into Medicare. And so that's where having someone trained on staff within your Ryan White program can be really, really helpful. Um, the training typically includes a blend of self-paced online training webinars and virtual and, and or in-person um, group sessions. And there's no cost associated with becoming a SHIP counselor. Um, it's considered a voluntary uh, uh, certification. So in order to become a SHIP counselor, your organization must first be a SHIP certified site. So if your organization is not already a SHIP site, uh, your organization's program director can reach out to your state Department of Public Health or your local SHIP to find out more about the qualifications for the organization and then how um, staff can become SHIP certified counselors as well. So we'll ch we've chatted out um, information, more information about that. All right, so now we're going to get to our next poll, and I apologize for our technical difficulties today, um, but this we'll do this again via chat. So this next poll is, what challenges have you faced when connecting with a SHIP counselor? So is it identifying a point of contact, establishing a referral partnership, getting program staff trained to be a SHIP counselor, or you're not familiar with SHIP, or your another option, maybe you already have a great work, working relationship with um, a SHIP counselor. So let us know um, in the chat um, as this helps us really to figure out, um, it helps us to, to determine what additional resources we can develop on behalf of the ACTA Center for Ryan White programs. So I'm seeing folks um, chat in that you're not, some people are not familiar with SHIP. So I hope that little overview helped you understand a bit more about SHIP. Um, and some folks are saying that um, some a challenge for some folks is identifying a point of contact. So that's all really helpful to see. Um, but for the most part, folks are, the challenges are either not familiar with SHIP or identifying a point of contact. Um, so yes, hope that information that we shared is helpful. We really encourage you to, um, to, uh, to find out about SHIP counselors available in your area. And um, the link that we shared with you should take you to the SHIP uh, website where you can um, find uh, local SHIP counselors in your area and the SHIP organizations. So we'll move on to the next poll, um, which, which is what types of Medicare TA or training resources would be um, most helpful for you? Would it be a job aid for case managers? an e-learning module, webinar, discussion guide, or something else. So I know we asked earlier, we were asking about marketplace resources. So now we're specifically looking into, um, into your input, looking for your input on Medicare TA and training resources. If you can talk, uh, go ahead and chat those in. So again, seeing e-learning module as a top, um, as a top request and job aids. Liesl, do you want to share what we mean when we say job aid? Sure, yeah. So a job aid would be a um, 
a fact sheet or a discussion guide or discussion guides here, I guess, but a fact sheet um, or uh, or like an eligibility um, decision tree that will help you um, in, in determining, for instance, what your client may be elig eligible for or which type of um, like which components of, the, of a Medicare um, plan your would best meet the needs of your clients. So that's what we mean by job aid. All right, thank you for all those. And then finally, if you'll bear with us, sorry for, again for the technical difficulties, but if you'll bear with us with one last poll is just what types of Medicare resources would be most helpful to give your clients. So a printable PDF fact sheet, um, a palm card or brochure or sort of smaller, more succinct fact sheet um, that's in a, in a palm card, sort of postcard size, an online fact sheet, so a link or QR code that could direct them to information online, an online frequently asked question or, or something else that we haven't listed here, we're open to that. Um, so seeing brochures and PDFs, so it looks like printables are the most helpful. Um, and that's great to know. And I do wanna just make a plug for a lot of our resources um, if you ever want to customize your resource, our resources for your program, please, please reach out to that. And we're hoping to be able to share some examples um, in the future of ways that some Ryan White programs have been customizing some of the ACE materials specifically for their um, audiences. Great. Thank you for all of this. I'm seeing a lot of printable PDFs and brochures. So thank you. Um, yeah, it's really helpful for us in, in, in helping us to figure out how to focus um, future resource development and which types of resources to develop for you all um, and your clients. So thank you for that input. Um, so now I'll hand it back over to Molly to um, round us out with resources. Great. Thanks, Liesl. So um, I'm just going to speed us through just showing you a few, a handful of the resources that we have to, to help your and support your work. And then We've gotten a ton of great questions, so we're gonna we're gonna get to that um, shortly. So on the next slide, you'll see um, this is the decision tree that Lisa was mentioning. So this is the resource. This is the job aid um, that we referenced. It has a series of yes or no questions that um, a case manager could sit with the client and sort of work through, and helping someone determine um, whether a person might be eligible for Medicaid, Medicare, or private insurance or marketplace coverage. Um, and it's both a helpful way of getting of getting to that answer and also facilitating the conversation where you're discussing um, health coverage needs, health coverage wants, um, maybe, you know, financially what a person is thinking they might be able to afford, things like that. So um, this resource is a great job aid we have um, for folks. On the next slide is the account tune-up tool. Um, I spoke earlier pretty briefly about account tune-ups, um, but this, this resource walks you through all the steps of an account tune-up. Um, and um, this is specific to Marketplace Open Enrollment. Um, and so that is um, able to be downloaded. Um, Connor just chatted that out. We also have, um, next is a, a screenshot of our newest resource, um, which is a searchable compilation of frequently asked questions about Marketplace SCPs. So this FAQ is organized into nine categories, um, including um, SCP basics, some questions around COBRA, and folks who are newly eligible for the Marketplace. Um, so please do, this is located on our website. Um, again, the search functionality is really great. So please um, head there with any questions related to um, any SCPs um, that your clients might be interested or eligible for. Um, on the next slide, we have three of our Medicare tools. So these um, include the basics of Medicare for Ryan White clients um, on the left, in the middle, the prescription drug coverage for Ryan White clients, and then on the right is how Medicare enrollment works. And so these are three really great introductory materials um, that are going to sort of provide a foundational understanding of what, a me what Medicare covers and how to enroll. Um, on this slide, you'll see this is our, our ABCDs of Medicare coverage tool, and this is a client-facing tool. So this is specifically intended to be printed and handed or, or work, you know, gone through with a client. Um, it's a two-pager that summarizes, again, the three parts of Medicare and then the differences between original and Medicare and Medicare Advantage. And similar to our searchable marketplace SEP FAQ, 
a lot of acronyms there. We have a screenshot here of our searchable Medicare FAQ. Um, we've been updating this. Um, this is not, uh, we've been updating this as we go. And recently, just a few months ago, included uh, several more questions, seven, ad several additional questions um, related to transitions from other forms of health coverage to Medicare. Um, so this is a sort of living document. We're always updating it as information becomes um, more clear or information is released. So please do return to this as you are um, working uh, to enroll clients and, and having questions. And then finally, we have our Fundamentals of Medicare and Medicaid Dual Eligibility for Ryan White Clients tool. So this tool explains um, how folks become dually eligible, enrollment considerations and best practices, financial help and more. It's a great, it's a, it's a really great, thorough, comprehensive resource. Um, and so I'm happy to share that with you all today. So with that, we are going to, we can take down the slides and we can get into the Q&A. So as I mentioned, we received a number of great questions today. Um, we'll get through as many as we can. Um, I'm gonna have, let me see here. I'm going to have, Amy, if you could come on video, we're going to start with a question related to the um, the the section fifteen fifty seven that I was mentioning in the Medicare section. I had sort of referenced it as a new protection, um, which it is not. So I want to be very clear about that. It's not a new protection. But Amy, do you want to talk a little bit about um, why we're talking about section fifteen fifty seven um, now? Why is it a, a hot topic? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question and it's a really good um, and astute um, distinction. So, Section 1557 that refers to a specific provision in the Affordable Care Act. So it's a part of federal statute and federal law that has been in place continuously since 2010. So in that sense, it's not new. It has been in effect and it, and it has remained in effect since the law was enacted. What has changed are the regulations that have been issued by the Department of Health and Human Services that um, give sort of contours and clarification as to how uh, expansively or narrowly that provision, that, that non-discrimination protection should be interpreted. So the, the long and short of it is that those regulations have really um, changed um, and in, in some administrations. So under the Obama administration, you saw an expansive uh, view of Section 5057, especially its application to health insurance products, um, health insurance plans, um, and its uh, interpretation of sex discrimination as inclusive of gender identity. So then you saw under a different administration, the Trump administration, a retraction of that. So 1557 was not interpreted to apply to health insurance plans, and the sex discrimination um, inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity was also um, scrapped from that rule. Then you have a new administration, the Biden administration, and that's what's new. The Biden administration released a final rule last May re reinstating the original interpretation of Section 1557. So the original Obama administration sort of expansive interpretation. Um, and, and actually that rule that was released in May goes even farther in terms of the gender identity discrimination protections in health insurance and, and really um, calls out these uh, bans on any gender affirming care as discriminatory um, when that care is provided to folks um, who are not seeking it for gender affirming care reasons. So litigation continues, um, and and while Section 1557, again, like that's never been struck down, that has been the law of the land. But because the the rule, that final rule released in May, is under litigation, and there's there's court cases about it right now, um, the enforcement of the rule does does become hampered. So the Office of Civil Rights, the federal agency charged with enforcing Section 1557, they are not really able to take any action, particularly on the gender identity protections right now because of litigation. So it's a watch and see, but you're right to point out it's it's nuanced and Section 1557 has been the law of the land and hopefully the litigation will resolve and we'll, we'll have more clarity on the contours of it going forward. Great, thanks Amy. And yeah, thank you for that, um, that clarifying question. Um, Amy, while I have you, and sort of while we're talking about things that have been around for a while, is there, someone asked, is there still no ability to get an ACA plan if a person's income is less than 100% of the federal poverty line? 
Yeah, it's another um, it's another good question. Um, and the, the short answer is um, yes, that's still generally true. That was um, in place again when the Affordable Care Act was enacted. Um, and, and really, it's it, the, the biggest impact of that rule is on people who live in non-Medicaid expansion states. So it, the, the, the provision that sort of says that the premium tax credits start at 100% of the federal poverty level, that's kind of a, a vestige of the idea that Medicaid expansion was supposed to happen in every state. Um, that was part of how the Affordable Care Act was written. And then you had the Supreme Court decision in 2012 that made Medicaid expansion optional. So that really affects people who are under the federal poverty level in non-Medicaid expansion states. Because if you're in a Medicaid expansion state, in most cases, if you're under the federal poverty level, you'll be eligible for Medicaid based on that low income. The one exception that has always been an exception, and it's a really important exception, is for lawfully present immigrants who aren't eligible for Medicaid. They can qualify for premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions if they meet all the other um, eligibility requirements. So that's that's going to be your your lawfully present immigrants who are in um, mostly it's going to be your lawfully present immigrants who are in your five year uh, waiting period before they can access Medicaid. They can access premium tax credit. So a small but important exception. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, Lisa, I'll come to you with a couple questions. So. Um, Someone asked, can a client disenroll or re-enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan? Great, thank you. yes, I'm here. Um, thank you, yeah. So there is an open enrollment period for Medicare Advantage plans every year from January 1st to March 31st. So during that time, a client can, a, a person, an individual who has existing Medicare and a Medicare Advantage plan um, can make changes to their coverage. So they can make any changes of, um, within that plan or also choose to disenroll and enroll in a new plan. Thanks, Lisa. And while I have you, um, let's say someone's going through that process or someone um, is interested in um, having someone help them understand um, their options or their benefits, what would be the best, best way to, to get some help for a client um, through this process? Great. Yeah. So I touch on this in my slides, um, but it would be a, a, a SHIP counselor. So they are really able to understand the eligibility requirements um, for Medicare. And as I talked about earlier, you know, I the ideal scenario is to have a SHIP counselor on staff within your um, Ryan White or HIV program, because then the SHIP counselor not can understand both pieces, both the eligibility requirements for Medicare, as well as the eligibility requirements and the specific for, for Ryan White and ADAP and the specific needs of people um, with HIV um, and their, their care and medication um, needs. So that, that is the most ideal scenario. Or um, if you work in tandem with a SHIP counselor, case manager and SHIP counselor to help them navigate, um, help a client pick out um, the, the most appropriate program or, or plan for them. Um, but SHIP is definitely very helpful and they get individualized training um, on en enrollment in into Medicare and how to help um, beneficiaries enroll. So we do highly recommend them and either a partnership or having in-house SHIP counselor. Great, thanks Lisa. Mm -hmm. um, while we are on Medicare enrollment, um, Amy, uh, we have received a question about um, someone who is enrolled um, in a uh, someone who's duly eligible, they're enrolled through in well care and they're not happy with their coverage. They want to make a change. Um, this person asked how this person might go about finding a better plan and possibly pay less uh, on on a monthly basis. So when would that be? Yeah, it's a really good um, a good question. Uh, so Medicaid and and, and Medicare beneficiaries, so the the dual eligibles that that Lisa talked about. Um, they're often en enrolled in, basically it's a form of a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, it's it's often referred to as a, a dual special needs plan, but in, in essence, it's a Medicare Advantage plan. So just like people who are in Medicare Advantage plans have the opportunity to make switches, so too do people in the dual special needs plans. Um, they they can also switch. Uh, with the, the dually eligible folks, there's, there's a little bit extra protection so they can switch more than just once a year. They can actually switch once during each three month enrollment period. 
Um, and they can also switch during the Medicare annual enrollment period that we went over that starts October 15th and goes through um, December 7th. So there lots of opportunity to switch. So if, if somebody is not happy with their plan, um, it definitely makes sense to be looking at um, if there are other better options out there. Great. Thanks, Amy. And while I, there's a question in the chat here. So someone that, that's important and I want to touch on. So someone asked about, um, about whether or not Medicare Advantage or original Medicare plans might have a pre-existing clause that clients might be, or potential beneficiaries might be subject to, um, who might be looking to enroll. Um, is this, is this true? Um, and I, I can only I can only sort of guess at what the pre-existing provision is is referring to, um, whether because it just says pre-existing provision, and I don't know if that means like a pre-existing condition Fair. exclusion or if you're referring to a different provision um, that that may exist in the plan. So uh, I can't really answer that. If you're talking about a pre-existing condition exclusion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, all right. So if you're talking about a pre-existing condition exclusion, um, no, like Medicare does not have pre-existing condition exclusions. Um, so that will not happen and your your clients should not be um penalized in, in any way for having a pre-existing condition. Where pre-existing conditions do come up, and that's important, is in the Medigap market. Medigap, which is the supplemental insurance plans, right, that only go with traditional Medicare to help cover the cost sharing for traditional Medicare. Medigap plans, think of those as kind of like the Wild West. There are very little regulations on that market. So they can and do have pre-existing condition exclusions, which is why the advice that um, that I give is if you think your client, their only guaranteed issue when you originally uh, are eligible for Medicare. And after that, they aren't guaranteed issue, meaning you could be denied or charged super high premiums based on your condition. So Medigap, that's where that might come up, but not Medicare Advantage and not traditional Medicare. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, all right. Um, we've got a question here um, that actually I might just talk through. So someone, um, when we were talking about the new Medicare changes for 2025, um, the, uh, the smoothing plan, the Medicare prescription payment plan, someone said, so is it correct that there's two bills um, sent to a client. Um, so yes, there will be two bills sent to a client. One will be for the Medicare Part D premium that they'll receive every month as they do. The second bill will then be for if they opt into the plan, the program, the smoothing program, um, that person would also then receive a bill for the smooth payment for their prescription drugs. Um, the Ryan White program, including ADAP, may be able to pay a client's smooth bill that there may be the option or the, the functionality for that, but there are a number of reasons why it may not make sense for a Ryan White client to enroll into the Medicare prescription payment plan in the first place. Um, so as Amy noted, we will have a webinar on this um, in late October. We will go through everything in great depth. I believe Amy used the word fun. It will be very fun. Um, so if that's your cup of tea, come join us. Um, we'll chat out a link to the registration link um, right now. And um, so please do join us at the end of October. We'll have our, our partners, NASDAQ, joining us as well. So we'll talk through all the considerations um, for, for why a person may or may not choose to enroll into the smoothing plan. Um, okay, let me see here. So uh, quickly, Amy, or not quickly, uh, can people without a work history qualify for Medicare? Yes, so that's another, um, it is a great question. And um, the the short answer is yes, people without a work history, um, as long as they meet the other eligibility requirement for Medicare. So they're like, for instance, immigration status. But as long as you're meeting all of the other eligibility requirements, you can still get Medicare even without a work history. But the, the catch is that um, you're gonna have to pay more. So for instance, um, folks without the requisite work history are going to have a premium for Ryan White Part A, whereas if you've got that 10-year work history, generally you, you can access Ryan White Part A without a premium. Um, the other thing that's important if you're, you're helping clients who don't have a work history enroll in Medicare is that unlike people who um, uh, have the work history and once they turn 65, they're automatically enrolled in Part B, folks without that requisite work history, they have to, to um, sign up 
for Medicare Part B. So th there are just different considerations for folks without a work history, but Medicare is still um, still uh, available to them. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna try to get through maybe two more questions. Um, Lisa, someone um, asked a question about ADAPs being whether or not they are credit, it is considered creditable coverage. So um, just take a step back. If a client is turning 65, um, Medicare will penalize anyone without prescription drug coverage. So this person asked, does ADAP count as qualified access to medications, also known as creditable coverage? And would um, being enrolled in ADAP prevent a client's client from um, incurring that 10% penalty? Yep. So unfortunately, ADAP isn't considered creditable coverage. Um, so they would need to enroll in a prescription drug plan. Some examples of creditable coverage um, beyond a, a Medicare plan are that some employer-based prescription drug coverage plans are considered credible coverage. Um, SPAPs or state pharmaceutical assistance programs are um, considered, as well as military-related coverage, such as VA or TRICARE. And then some supplemental Medigap policies will qualify as um, creditable coverage. Awesome. Thanks so much, Liesl. So Amy, I'm going to have you answer one more question, and then we're going to wrap up. So um, can you talk about can you talk about the relationship between someone being offered employer sponsored insurance um, and whether or not then that person has access to marketplace insurance um, and also talking about thinking about the offer of whether or not that employer sponsored insurance is considered affordable? Yeah, it's a really good question. And so I kind of want to break it up into like the exact two parts that you just described, Molly. So there's the, the first part about enrolling in marketplace coverage. And folks can enroll in marketplace coverage even if they have access to employer coverage. That's their choice. They can say, I don't want my employer coverage. I'm going to enroll in a marketplace plan. But to be eligible for premium tax credits, that's where the, the access to affordable um, employer coverage comes in. To be eligible for premium tax credits, someone cannot have access to an affordable offer of employer coverage. So it's either they can't be enrolled in affordable employer coverage, they can't even have an offer of affordable employer coverage. So that's a different distinction, right? So they could just enroll in marketplace plan without subsidies and nobody cares if you have an offer of employer coverage, but to get the premium tax credits, they have to demonstrate that the employer coverage is unaffordable. So what does that mean? That in practice, how the, the rules define unaffordable is that if employer coverage is over nine and a half percent of the person's income, then that coverage is deemed unaffordable. And there were actually some changes made in 2023 that made this test um, a little bit more generous in favor of the, um, the employee, the client, the enrollee. Um, so I think like the takeaways here from a Ryan White ADAP, a sister perspective is that Ryan White and ADAP like do not need to enforce the PTC eligibility rules. Like you all aren't in charge of PTC eligibility decision. That's really a, what the marketplace is going to do because it's complex, like figuring out that nine and a half percent of income rule and getting the documentation from the employer coverage. Like that is the job of the marketplace eligibility system. But it's really important to be aware of the rule and be aware that if a client wants to access premium tax credits and they have employer coverage um, or an offer of employer coverage, then that, that coverage has to be super expensive for them to get premium tax credits. And, and I'll just say in terms of the like questions about like what you do in terms of, of ADAP um, or Ryan White assistance in those cases, some ADAPs sort of make exceptions and they will pay for marketplace coverage without subsidies, even for someone who has what is deemed under the federal rules an affordable offer of employer coverage. And that's okay. That's allowable under the HRSA HIV AIDS Bureau rules for insurance purchase, as long as the insurance plan meets those broader, you know, the, the cost effective and coverage requirements, like that's fine. So it really is like ADAPs have to decide what's, what's best for the ADAP financially, what's best for the client. Um, but it, it is, they, they, people can enroll in the marketplace coverage um, if they have an offer of employer sponsored coverage that's affordable, it, they just won't get PTCs. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. 
So we are um, at time. We're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, please keep your webinar window open. Um, there will be an evaluation that pops up when we close the webinar today. We really want to hear your thoughts on today's presentation so we can continue refining and, and improving this presentation um, and, and help you all sort of continue to build your capacity around this, this important work. So um, you'll see our, our um, website there, targethiv.org slash ACE. You can sign up for our mailing list. You can download ACE tools and resources um, and much more. And, and then if you also think of any further questions after this ends today, um, you can always reach out to us with questions. Um, our email is acetacenter at jsi.com. Um, and you can always, again, feel free to reach out, out with, to us with questions. Um, or if you need help finding a resource, um, we are always here to help you. We hope to see everyone in late October for our, Medi our fun Medicare webinar. Um, and until then, take good care. And thank you so much for joining us today.